previous six videos, we have covered eight topical studies, exposing the intentional distortion and disinformation used by the Counter-Reformation to hide the contents of Revelation chapter 9 with intentional mistranslations, anachronistic transpositions, and jargonized vocabulary words. You saw how vocabulary obfuscations were intentionally employed, such as bottomless pit instead of abyss or crossbows, instead of scorpions, or breastplates, instead of plate armor, or Larica segmentata, or 200 million, instead of myriads of myriads, or the old Middle English term brimestone, instead of sulfur, etc. On and on the list goes. In video 12, you saw how the phrase bottomless pit was used to hide the actual term used by John, which was abyss and in historical context, was used as a reference to the catacombs, and the Roman conception of the place of the dead. In video 13, you saw how they use, the fiction of demonic scorpion bugs, supposedly living in the center of the earth, to hide John's very clear description, of the Roman Byzantium army with barded cavalry, that looked like locusts, and their most feared military weapon, the scorpion bow. In video 14, you saw how they intentionally distort the English translation of verse 6, to suggest their demonic bugs which live in the center of the earth, would produce living dead zombies, incapable of death, all the while hiding the fact, that it simply references the hypocrisy of the Byzantium army, that criminalized suicide on the one hand, and yet on the other, was worshipping a Roman deity, that was actually the bringer of sudden death, and yet they would never even know it, or realize it. In video 15, you discovered how they hide John's reference to breastplates of iron, actually referring to the rise of plate armor, made from iron, beginning with the emergence of Rome's Lorica Segmentata, and instead draw little bug shields, on their fictional demonic locust bugs, that allegedly live in the center of the earth, or claim it is future modern Kevlar, made from plastic polymers. Despite the fact, John clearly specifies, it is made from iron, just as plate armor really was. In video 16, you saw how they hide the reference to the Roman Greco deity Apollon, known as Apollo in Latin, behind intentional obfuscations of the entire Greek text, from verse 1 all the way to verse 11, and even went so far as to literally just fabricate, out of thin air, their own Bible verse, and inserted it into the Latin text, to actually hide his identity, in Latin. And in video 17, you saw how they lied about the text in verse 14, and attempted to interpret its meaning, as a reference to Babylonian legends about trapped river demons, from Babylonian sorcery. Despite the fact, the text says neither inside the river, nor that it is referencing demons. You saw how they hide the reference to gunpowder, in verses 17 and 18, by hiding the term, sulfurous, in the original text. And you saw how they hide John's use of Plato's hyperbolic numeric expression, of myriads of myriads, behind the unfeasible claim there will be a hyper-literalistic army body count, of an invasion force of 200 million men, when the claim itself is not even feasible logistically, requiring over 186,000 miles of geographic surface space, even if each person is just interpreted as a foot soldier only, instead of what the text actually describes, as a mounted cavalry. And now that you have seen what the text is actually describing, in each of these topics, it will be much easier to read, and its fulfillments in history, very apparent and unmistakable. Thus, precisely why, all those distortions were concocted and considered necessary, by the Counter-Reformation, to begin with. And now we are ready to exegete this chapter, unhindered by this information, from verse 1 all the way through verse 21, as it was intended to be read by his original first century audience. Now we are ready to dig into the texts of this chapter. First we will go through the chapter verse by verse to get a clear understanding of what is actually being said in the text, noting the key elements of his prophecies. As you have seen in the previous videos, we have spent a lot of time exposing the disinformation used to hide the content of these texts from the public. Because of that, as we go through this chapter, we are going to work directly from the underlying Greek text known as the Textus Receptus, or what is called, the received text, itself. This is the Greek manuscript family that forms the basis of the King James Version, and several other translations. The Textus Receptus, is the most widely received, and agreed upon Greek text, within all of Christendom. It is historically, 
the primary source documentation for Western Christianity. But as you have already seen, there is a lot of intentional obfuscation taking place in its translation to English. So we will look at the Greek text directly and work from a transliteration of the text into English, word for word, as it actually exists in the Greek text. And we will make some grammatical observations along the way to help us clarify what John was intending to communicate to his first century audience. As we will do that, we will grocery list his prophecies. After looking at the transliterated texts and listing his prophecies, we will compare them to what actually happened in history and see how they were fulfilled in history and how they mark the dominant rise of the Antichrist in Western civilization from within the Roman Empire. Precisely as John prophesied it would happen. We will look at the rise of the Antichrist in verse 1 and the description of this army in verses 2 through 12. After that we will look at the verses which describe the coming of the second army in verses 13 through 21. Revelation chapter 9 begins with the fifth trumpet in verse 1, and its transliteration reads as follows. Quote, and the fifth messenger trumpeted and I saw a star out of the heaven fallen into the land and given was to him, the key of the well of the abyss. End quote. There are many common errors and distortions concerning this text, which are corrected by the Greek grammar of the text many of which we have already covered, but here we shall make additional notes from the text which we will go through quickly. You have already seen how the phrase, the bottomless pit, is used to hide the term, abyss. And that the term translated as, pit, should be translated, as the word, well, like it is everywhere else, in the New Testament, outside the book of Revelation. So we have the translated phrase, the well of the abyss, instead of bottomless pit. And you saw that the phrase, well of the abyss, was a reference to the Roman conceptual watery place of the dead. And in historical context in the New Testament, it was a reference to the Roman catacombs. First we must note, the fifth messenger, translated angel, is not the star which falls from heaven. You will often hear them conflated. That is incorrect. The fifth messenger is separate from the star that falls from heaven. They are not the same entity. The star that falls from heaven, is the one that is given the key from the abyss. Not the fifth messenger. The imagery of the star fallen from heaven, is an exact echo of the Luciferian text, found in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12, written to the king of Babylon. Quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? End quote. As you saw in the previous videos, John's comparison of the Roman Empire to Babylon in the Old Testament, has already been made as early as the seal judgments, and here, he is repeating that same comparison again. John states this Babylonish Luciferian entity, is the one, given the key from the abyss. Secondly, you will often hear many counter-reformation preachers claim that God is the one who gives this abyss key, in verse 1. That claim is made simply because of their hidden, esoteric, Luciferian theological background which serves as a hidden prism through which they interpret all these texts in Revelation. But, the text does not state God is giving anything to anybody here. God is not mentioned in verse 1. At all. This text is a reference to a Luciferian imperial potentate, whom John is overtly comparing to the king of Babylon. The abyss key is given, but the text is very clear, there is no reference to God as the one who is doing the giving of that key. The text in verse 1 is a generic statement, and does not identify who it is, that is the one doing the giving of the key, from the abyss. Later in verse 11 however, John will, explicitly identify the one, who gives the key from the abyss. And it is definitely not God who gives him, the key from the abyss. It is the messenger of the abyss, who also carries the fires of Gehenna, that gives him that key. And furthermore, the phrase translated as, the key, in English, is in the genitive case in the Greek. And it is not the key, to, the abyss. But rather, it is the key, of, the abyss, meaning, from the abyss. Meaning that the abyss is both the origin of the key, and the place having ownership of the key, being discussed. It is the abyss key. It comes from the abyss, and belongs to the abyss, it is not a key which comes from God, or from heaven. But from the abyss, itself. That is simply what the Greek grammar states. 
philosophical discussions about the all-encompassing sovereignty of God, do not erase the grammar of this text. The text is clear concerning the origin of this key. It comes from the abyss, and is given to this future Roman Luciferian potentate, by the messenger of the abyss. Not God. Those are simply the grammatical facts, of this text. So in verse 1, the main elements of John's prophecy is that he sees an astronomical event, marking the rise of a Luciferian potentate in likeness of the king of Babylon. He sees a key being given, and that key comes from the abyss. And as you saw previously the term, abyss, in historical context, was used in the New Testament when speaking to Romans to refer to the conceptual Roman place of the dead, or in the city of Rome, the Roman catacombs. It was a term never used in addressing Jewish audiences. And as you have already seen in the video on astronomical dating for this chapter, John astronomically dates the occurrence of this event, around 312 AD. The main elements of this prophecy are 1. A meteor. 2. The rise of a Luciferian potentate. 3. A key of authority or power. Which 4. Comes from the Roman catacombs. And we know from his previously examined astronomical dating, the time frame for the beginning of these events, is placed around 312 AD. Verse 2 continues. Quote. And he opens the well of the abyss and arises smoke out of the well, like smoke of a furnace grate, and obscures the sun and the air out of the smoke of the well. End quote. As you saw in videos 12, 13, and 14, John is describing sets of opposites in chapter 9 verses 1 through 12, to drive home the idea of hypocrisy. In verse 1 he describes a star or light falling from heaven, and in verse 2 he describes it bringing darkness. This text was the theological origin of the use of the term, Dark Ages, as virtually all humanists and reformers, connected this very text to the rise of the papacy in medieval Europe. John mentions the abyss again, which was the Roman place of the dead, or catacombs, and says this entity will open it up, and smoke from it will darken the sun and the air. Like a great furnace. That reference to a great furnace will be an important one, both symbolically and literally. In verse 2, John sees this Luciferian ruler opening up the catacombs and bringing darkness upon the land, as if from a great furnace. So the main elements in verse 2 after 312 AD is 1, a rise in the importance and status of the catacombs. 2, darkness across the land and 3, a great furnace. In verse 3, John writes, quote, And out of smoke issued locusts into the land, and he gave them authority, like the ones having authority of scorpions, of the land. End quote. John writes here that he sees locusts come out of the smoke. As you recall once again, that was an opposite. Smoke was used to control locust swarms in the ancient world, but instead of the smoke exterminating the locusts as you would expect, the locusts actually come out of the smoke. The smoke actually brings the locusts. The star from heaven brings darkness and the smoke from the well brings locusts. In describing these opposites, John is simply echoing the biblical teaching concerning the curse on spiritual Babelism from the Tower of Babel, or as he later calls it, Mystery Babylon. It creates the very opposite of what it claims or intends to manifest, because it exchanges the definition of God with its opposite. Thus when it creates a spiritual manifestation, it creates the exact opposite as well. As you saw in the video on Mystery Babylon on this channel, and the study they did on prayer for hospital patients, creating the exact opposite effect, and actually killing them. You also remember from video 14, John is describing the barded horses of a cavalry in his comparison of them, to locusts, as he explicitly states in verse 7, because that is precisely how they looked. And in verse 3, he says this Luciferian potentate that arises after 312 AD, will give authority to this barded cavalry, the same kind of authority that is already given to the scorpions. Which was John's reference to the Roman archers and their greatly feared military weapon, which was actually called a scorpion. And as you recall the absurdity of the claim, John was referring to literal scorpion bugs or some strange otherworldly scorpion locust bug hybrid, was addressed in videos 12, 13, and 14. John is clearly prophesying about the changes coming to the Roman military after the seal judgments on the western half of the empire, and the first set of trumpet judgments on the eastern half of the empire. 
Now John is describing what will rise up in place of the eastern and western half of the old Roman Empire, under a new Luciferian potentate, after 312 AD. The main elements of John's prophecy in verse 3 is that 1, a new army will arise under the leadership of the new Luciferian potentate, and 2, it will be given the same kind of authority, as the current Roman military, in John's day. Or in other words, it will become the new army, of the Roman Empire. In verses 4, 5, and 6, we read, still yet, another set of stark opposites and contradictions dealing with life, death and killing, concerning this new Roman army. In verse 4, John writes, quote, And he commands them not to do harm to the pastures of the land, nor to the vegetation, nor to the tree, unless the men remaining do not have the seal of God upon their foreheads. End quote. Here we see the opposites again. John compares this army to locusts, but then says they are commanded not to harm any vegetation, which is precisely what locusts feed off of, and with this opposite, he includes the statement, that they are also commanded not to harm the people of God. <laughs> Illustrating, the command not to harm the people of God, will be as worthless as telling locusts not to eat anything green. The comparison, clearly illustrating, in John's opinion, it will not be in their nature to even keep those commands. Pretty much, like telling a duck not to quack, or a bird not to fly. But here, in verse 4, John does prophesy they will be commanded not to hurt the people of God, and not to engage in pillaging. But it will be a worthless hypocritical command, that will not be kept. Any more, than telling locusts, not to eat any vegetation. In verse 5, John continues his description of opposites and contradictions, concerning this new Roman army under the Antichrist. He writes, Quote, and he grants to them that they not kill them, but that they torture months five, and the torture of them like torture of a scorpion when strikes a man. End quote. As you saw in video 14, the scorpion he is referring to here in this text, is the Mediterranean variety, or Adroctona scorpion, translated as, the man killer. Which the Roman crossbow was actually named after. So on the one hand they are told not to kill the people of God, but on the other, they are allowed to instead torture them to death. And gives the time value of 5 months, which converts to 150 years, in John's use of Old Testament, Jewish prophetic dating. So in verse 5, John prophesies they will be authorized by the Antichrist, to go on a torture campaign for 150 years. And instead of simply killing God's people, they will torture them to death inflicting a very slow and painful death on them, under the pretense, of not killing. Once again pointing out their hypocrisy, and contradiction. Death by a man-killer, Scorpion Sting, was one of the most extremely slow and painful deaths anyone could die from, in the historical context of John's day. This is the first of two references, to the campaign of torture, by this army. The second reference comes in verse 10. Most assume they are simply two references to the same one thing. But he is mentioning it twice for a reason, because he is indicating two separate campaigns of torture. So in verse 5, John prophesies that 1, there will be a campaign of torture authorized by the Antichrist, 2, it will be done under the pretense of not killing, and 3, it will kill people who belong to God, in very slow, painful, and gruesome deaths. John continues describing this new Roman army under the Antichrist, in verse 6, quote, And in those days, they worship the men of death and not perceive it and set their heart upon dying but shun the death from them. End quote. As noted in video 13, verse 6 reads substantially different in the Greek text, than what is translated into English. The word translated as, seek, into English in this verse, is an Hebraic expression, which means to venerate or to worship. And the text is actually criticizing the army of the Antichrist and its practices, not the victims of their torture, as counter-reformationists always explain this text. John is continuing to describe opposites or contradictions about the army of the Antichrist. It says they will worship death and not perceive it. And they will desire martyrdom, yet even death will run from them. That prophecy is intended again as an insult. John is saying that despite the fact, they literally will be worshipping death, even death will not want them. This contradiction concerning death, is also a prophecy, which we will see fulfilled in history. In verse 7, John explains his use of locust imagery, pertains to the visual appearance of an army of men and its cavalry. Not literal locusts. 
As you saw in videos 12, 13 and 14, John was making a clear reference to Bardid Calvary. He writes in verse 7, quote, And the look of the locusts, resembled horses prepared unto warfare, and upon the head of them like crowns similar to gold, and the faces of them, as the faces of men. End quote. In verse 7, John states 1, the locust symbolism refers to the visual appearance of the Calvary and 2, they have something that looks like crowns of gold on their heads, referring to the visual appearance, of their helmets. In verse 8, John notes that 1, they wore long hair, and 2, that they have teeth which look like lion's teeth. In verse 9, which we covered in video 14, John observes 1, they are wearing plate armor made from iron and 2, their horses have something which resembled feathers and made lots of noise, when the horses ran. Precisely as barded horses did. All that plate metal hitting against itself, made barded horses very noisy, when they ran into battle. In verse 10, John mentions the Roman scorpion bows again, and makes his second reference to a campaign of torture. And in verse 11, which we looked at in video 15 and 16, John identifies the real identity of the deity worshipped by the Antichrist and his army as being Apollyon, a spelling variant of the name, Apollo. The Roman god of the sun, who was born on December 25th. In verse 12, John concludes his description of the rise of the Antichrist, and his army. Stating that this was the fulfillment of the first woe. And the fifth trumpet. So far, in the first 12 verses of Revelation chapter 9, we have the following list of prophecies. Verse 1, 1. A meteor impact. 312 AD, 2. The rise of a Luciferian potentate over the Roman Empire. 3. A key of authority or power. 4. From the Roman catacombs. Verse 2, 5. A rise in the importance and status of the catacombs. 6. Darkness across the land. 7. Smoke from a great furnace. Verse 3, 8. The rise of a new kind of Roman army. 9. Given the same kind of authority as the current Roman military. Verse 4, 10. They will be commanded not to hurt the people of God or pillage. 11. But this command will be contradictory to their nature and ignored. Verse 5, 12. They will be authorized to conduct a campaign of torture. 13. It will be under the pretense of not killing. 14. But it will kill the people of God, in very slow painful gruesome deaths. Verse 6. 15. They will worship death and not know it. 16. They will desire martyrdom, and death will flee from them. Verse 7. 17. Their cavalry will have barded armored horses. 18. And they will have helmets similar in appearance, to golden crowns worn by kings. Verse 8, 19. They will have long hair, 20. They will have teeth like lions. Verse 9, 21. They will have metal armor made of iron, 22. They will have noisy horse armor, with a feathered appearance. Verse 10, 23. There will be a second campaign of torture. Verse 11, 24. And they will have Apollo the Greco-Roman sun god born on December 25th, as their king. This concludes the fifth trumpet which is also the first woe. In just 11 verses, John gives us 24 prophecies concerning events beginning around 312 AD. With a list of 24 prophecies and a clearly defined time frame of 312 AD, it would be pretty hard to miss all this in history, wouldn't it? Unless of course, that was precisely your goal to begin with. Now let's take a look at what actually happened, and compare those events, to these prophecies. Now we will look at how these 24 prophecies in Revelation 9 verses 1 through 11 were fulfilled in history. And as we do, remember that John states, once these events have happened, the first woe, and the fifth trumpet have been fulfilled. He states that explicitly in the text, so that fact, is a non-negotiable biblical truth. Once they have occurred in history, like the crucifixion of Christ itself, it is finished. And counter-reformation propagandists who attempt to make them all future from that point forward, are simply attempting to deceive their audiences. John states explicitly, in verse 12, at that point, it is past. And the sixth trumpet comes next. End of story. In verse 1, John prophesies four key elements, 
1. A meteor impact will occur around 312 AD. 2. It will mark the rise of a Luciferian potentate over the Roman Empire. 3. That new Luciferian potentate will be given a key of authority or power. And 4. It will come from the Roman catacombs. So the question now is, did this prophecy occur in history? The Counter-Reformation would have you believe, this text has never happened in history. But in order to argue that position, they create a number of blatant textual distortions, in order to argue it. If it had never happened in history, then why would all those distortions and obfuscations of the text, be necessary? Obviously they wouldn't. And that is how you can know, they are in fact, hiding the actual fulfillments of these texts. First, John gives us the year 312 AD, and a history-changing sign in the sky, marking the beginning of the fifth trumpet. The sad thing about all this, is that the Counter-Reformation, is fully aware of what they are attempting to hide from the public. That is to say, they fully know these things did, in fact, already occur in history. They are fully aware of what you are about to be shown. They just don't want you to know it. The Counter-Reformation knows that if you look at verse 1, and compare it to history, you are going to discover it has clearly occurred, and it occurred precisely as John prophesied it would, beginning precisely in the year 312 AD. And it occurred in such literal and blatant terms, the only way to manage the text, is to simply hide it. John prophesied in 312 AD, a sign would be seen in the heaven. Just as there was the sign of a star in the heaven, when Christ was born. So too, concerning the rise of the Antichrist, there would be the sign of a falling star, echoing the imagery of the Lucifer text in Isaiah written to the king of Babylon, when the Antichrist comes to power. And when you look into history, around 312 AD, that is literally, precisely and exactly, what you will find. The following article was published by BBC News June 23, 2003. Entitled, Space Impact Saved Christianity. By the word, Christianity, the BBC is referring to Roman Catholicism, because the UK is now officially, a Vatican Church state. As the Anglican Church of England, has been officially merged with Roman Catholicism as part of the Counter-Reformation. But, as you will recall, this religious ideology was known by the name Nicolaitanism in the New Testament, and associated with the coming Nicolaitan Antichrist. The BBC article reads as follows, quote, A team of geologists believes it has found the incoming space rocks impact creator, and dating suggests its formation, coincided with the celestial vision, said to have converted a future Roman emperor to Christianity. It was just before a decisive battle, for control of Rome and the Empire, the Constantine saw a blazing light cross the sky, and attributed his subsequent victory, to divine help from a Christian god. Constantine went on to consolidate his grip on power, and ordered that persecution of Christians cease, and their religion receive official status. In the 4th century AD, the fragmented Roman Empire was being torn apart by civil war. Constantine and Maxentius, were bitterly fighting to be the sole emperor. Constantine was the son of the Western Emperor Constantius Chlorus. When he died in 306, his father's troops proclaimed Constantine Emperor. But in Rome, the favorite was Maxentius, son of Constantius's predecessor, Maximian. With both men claiming the title, a conference was called in AD 308, that resulted in Maxentius being named as senior emperor, along with Galerius, his father-in-law. Constantine was to be a junior emperor. The situation was not a stable one, however, and by 312 the two men were at war. Constantine overran Italy, and faced Maxentius at the Milvan Bridge, over the Tiber River, a few kilometers from Rome. Both knew it would be a decisive battle, with Constantine's forces outnumbered. It was then, that something strange happened. Eusebius, one of the Christian Church's historians, relates the event, and his account of the conversion of Constantine. Quote, While he was thus praying with fervent entreaty, a most marvelous sign appeared to him from heaven, the account of which it might have been hard to believe, had it been related by any other person. About noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes, the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens, above the sun, and bearing the inscription, conquered by this. At this sight, he himself was struck with amazement, and his whole army also, which followed him on this expedition, 
and witnessed this miracle. End quote. Spurred on by divine intervention, Constantine's army won the day, and he gave homage to the god of the Christians, whom he believed had helped him. But what was the celestial event that converted Constantine and altered the course of history? Jens Ormo, a Swedish geologist, and colleagues working in Italy, believe Constantine witnessed a meteoroid impact. The research team believes it has identified what remains of the impactor's crater. It is the small, circular crater del Sirmtia, in central Italy. It is clearly an impact crater, Ormo says, because its shape fits, and it is also surrounded by numerous smaller, secondary craters, gouged out by ejected debris, as expected from impact models. Radiocarbon dating put the crater's formation at about the right time to have been witnessed by Constantine, and there are magnetic anomalies detected around the secondary craters, possibly due to magnetic fragments from the meteorite. According to Ormo, it would have struck the Earth with the force of a small nuclear bomb, perhaps a kiloton in yield. It would have looked like a nuclear blast, with a mushroom cloud, and shock waves. It would have been quite an impressive sight, and, if it was what Constantine saw, could have turned the tide of the conflict. But what would have happened, if this chance event, perhaps as rare as once every few thousand years, had not occurred, in Italy at that time? Maxentius might have won the battle. Roman history, would have been different and the struggling Christians might not have received state patronage. The history of Christianity and the establishment of the popes in Rome might have been very different. <laughs> Quote, the establishment of the popes in Rome might have been very different. End quote. Not only does this article by the BBC connect it directly to Constantine's sign of the key row in the sky, but they even directly connect it to the rise of the papacy in Rome. Vatican counter-reformationists will no doubt over time attempt to create an alternate narrative for this impact crater, and it probably will be as ridiculous as their explanation of the Book of Revelation. But there is one thing about all this that even the most fanatical counter-reformationists cannot deny. The account of the astronomical sighting by Constantine and his whole army is recorded by their own church historian, Eusebius, in his own words, the writing of which was commissioned by the papacy itself. Thus, discovery of the impact crater itself is simply the icing on the cake. The record of what happened was provided by the papacy itself in the words of its own historian, Eusebius. Shortly after this event, it was Emperor Constantine who created the Roman office of the Pope, by giving Pope Sylvester, the crown of Pontifex Maximus, as he came to him riding on a white horse, as John had prophesied the Antichrist would come. And as the sign of the crown over Sagittarius, had just previously appeared in the sky, as you saw in video 6 and 7 on the sign of the white horse, and the Antichrist. And thus prophecies, number 1 and 2, in Revelation chapter 9 verse 1, are confirmed as history. Prophecies 3 and 4 prophesy that this Luciferian ruler, we now know as the rise of the papacy, would be given a key of authority, and it would be connected to the well of the abyss, or, the Roman place of the dead, in historical context, the Roman catacombs. How were these two prophecies fulfilled in the rise of the papacy? In the declaration of the Edict of Thessalonica, Pope Damasus' claim to authority over all Christendom came from his claim that Peter had come to Rome and given the Bishop of Rome the keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, given to him by Christ. Once the Bishop of Rome had been elevated to the position of Rome's Pontifex Maximus, these keys of authority now allegedly belonged to Rome. The proof of this claim was that Peter's very bones were housed in the catacombs of Rome, thus fulfilling prophecies 3 and 4 of Revelation chapter 9 verse 1. The Vatican's problem was, of course, is that it was complete fiction. Peter had never made his way to Rome, and the bones Rome had in its catacombs had nothing to do with Peter. In fact, Rome has been finding the bones of St. Peter ever since. Precisely because, they never had them, to begin with. And John's prophecy about the Antichrist's authority, 
arising from the Roman place of the dead known as the catacombs, long before the Vatican ever even thought to propagate this fraud, completely exposed the claim as a deception before it even began. We know Peter never made his way to Rome, from the New Testament. The material in Acts and Galatians demonstrates Peter was still in Syria, 12 years after Rome claims it had already been given its keys, and Peter was reigning as the first pope in Rome. And at no point, does the New Testament, ever, put Peter in Rome. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter was cited as the apostle to the Jews. Paul went to Rome and ultimately died there. And although he greets scores of Christian leaders in the city of Rome, neither the name of Peter, nor any of his associates, are ever mentioned even a single time, long past the time, Rome claims Peter was allegedly ruling as Pope over all Christians, there. Not a single reference, to either him, or his associates. So how then, did Rome get the idea, Peter's bones were actually there? The explanation for this fiasco comes from one of Rome's saints known as Saint Ambrose. The official history of St. Ambrose, by the Roman Church, is mostly fabricated revisionism, to clean up his image. What is known, is that St. Ambrose admittedly, was elected Bishop of Milan, as an unbaptized pagan, before he was even converted to Christianity. Submitting to Christian baptism, only after he was elected bishop. Ambrose was the Roman governor of Emilia Liguria, known as the second capital. As the Roman governor, he attempted to quell an ongoing fight, between two theological Roman sects, known as the Arians and the Nicaeans. During his mediation of the fight, the people wanted the fighting to stop, and neither side to win, and thus demanded Ambrose as a neutral third party, the unbaptized Roman governor, to serve as the Bishop of Milan. Despite the fact, he had never even formally converted, to Christianity. Ambrose was in reality, a Roman pagan necromancer, who had a religious cult which frequented crypts, looking to absorb the spiritual powers of corpses, by fondling their bones and rotting flesh, in order to absorb their residual spiritual powers. According to Ambrose's own writing, the process he used to determine, the identity of the corpses, was that they would meander through the crypts, tombs, and catacombs strolling along the corpses, until one of his cult members would go into spontaneous convulsions. When one of these convulsive fits occurred, it indicated the corpse was a spiritually potent source, to be fondled for power, and during the process of fondling the rotting corpses, the identity of the deceased, would supernaturally be revealed to them. For example, such as a great sorcerer, a great leader, or some legendary saint. Saint Ambrose the pagan necromancer, is the source of venerating the rotted bones, fingers and flesh of corpses, in the modern Roman Catholic Church today. And it all came, directly from Ambrose's practices of necromancy, in the catacombs. And that is how Rome came to believe they had the bones of Saint Peter. The unbaptized pagan necromancer, Roman governor Ambrose, is said to be one of the four, great doctors, of the Roman Church. And you can see his influence on their theology, still to this day. The bones found under Saint Peter's Basilica, originally claimed to have been Peter's, were tested for DNA, and turned out to have come from three different individuals, two of whom were women, and also included a variety of bones from chickens, rats, and pigs. None of which, resembling anything, that would have looked like Peter. An actual grave, marked with the name of Peter, and thought to possibly have been his tomb, was discovered in Jerusalem in the 1950s, by Franciscan archaeologists. The remains were subsequently and quietly ordered, to be taken to Rome. So we see that all four prophecies of Revelation chapter 9 verse 1, were fulfilled in the rise of the papacy in Rome shortly after 312 AD. And we also see, that John identifies Rome's Pontifex Maximus coronated by Constantine, clearly as the Antichrist and his prophecies in verse 1. And this is what the Counter-Reformation, works on relentlessly, to keep hidden from the Christian public, for political reasons. If you are familiar with the scriptures, you are aware of the fact, that in the scriptures, even touching a dead person, rendered a person unclean. 
necromancy, or the practice of communicating with the dead, and certainly fondling corpses for spiritual power, was called out as an abomination, punishable by death, in the Torah. Which is as strong a condemnation, as could have possibly been given. But John is pointing to this very issue in these texts, to clearly distinguish the coming Antichrist and his followers, and their religious practices, as something not coming from, or originating from, or consistent with, the God of the Scriptures, in any way. And he is providing a reference to this issue, as an Exhibit A, in the prophetic argument against them, and what he knew would be, their future claims. Despite the condemnation of necromancy, well known among biblically literate communities, necromancy played a very important role in the dominant Roman religious culture, of John's day. There were entire feast days in the Roman calendar, set aside for communing with the dead, in cemeteries, tombs and catacombs. Nicolaitans, who claimed to be Christian, but were in reality Roman syncretists, naturally assimilated these Roman customs, without any hesitations, including the very condemned practice of necromancy. And that practice of assimilation, especially focusing on the subject of necromancy, is now brought up by John, in these texts. The transliteration of Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 reads as follows. And he opens the well of the abyss, and arises smoke out of the well, like smoke of a furnace grate, and obscures the sun and the air out of the smoke of the well. The first part of this text states that this future Luciferian potentate, after being given a key of authority from the abyss, would quote, open up the well of the abyss. End quote. And this expression, is a very odd expression. We know that the term abyss is being used to refer to the Roman place of the dead. But how on earth would the well of the place of the dead, be opened? And what exactly does that mean? The Greek word translated as, opened up, is the word, anoigo. And it means, to open up. It comes from a conjunction of two Greek root words, ana, and oigo. Ana, means up, but also means severally, locally at, or each and every, conveying the idea of repetition or intensity. A lot, every, all, repeatedly, etc. Oigo means to open. So the point of this phrase is that this Luciferian entity, will do something, that will place an awful lot of emphasis, on the Roman place of the dead. There is going to be a full throttled emphasis on the Roman place of the dead. And he will open it, up with intensity and repetition. It's going to become a very big deal, expressed in the peculiar phrase, he opens up the well of the abyss. John's use of the terms, well, and abyss, are John's key words. A well is associated with water, and abyss, also associated with water, is used in reference to Rome's place of the dead. So in verse 2, we have prophecies 5, 6 and 7 stating that there will be a rise in the importance and status of the catacombs, seen in the phrase, he opens the well of the abyss. Secondly, there will be darkness across the land from the smoke arising out of it. And thirdly, the reference, to the comparison of the smoke, as if from a great furnace. So we have an indirect reference, to a furnace. Our key words are, 1, well, 2, abyss, 3, smoke, and 4, furnace. So how did this happen in history after 312 AD? As you saw previously John identifies the rise of the papacy in Rome under Constantine, as the coming of the Luciferian Antichrist, whom he compares to the king of Babylon, in Isaiah 14 exalting himself as equal to the throne of God. You also saw that the claim to his key of authority actually did come from the abyss, precisely as was prophesied. And the papacy, alleging that they possessed the actual bones of Peter, in the catacombs, as their proof. This emphasis on the catacombs, as the key of papal authority and source of spiritual power, led to an era of history, in which the search for holy relics, from the tombs and catacombs, exploded in the Roman Empire precisely as the fifth prophecy describes. Dr. Robert Grant, PhD, of St. Ambrose University, and author of St. Ambrose of Milan, a primer, writes, quote, bishops, brought them into the towns and under the altars of the churches. This was a common belief that the bodies of the martyrs were especially sacred and worthy of veneration. Many also believed they could work miracles. Among the period's most influential advocates for this renewed cult of the martyrs were bishops Damasus of Rome and Ambrose of Milan. Damasus popularized visits to the great catacombs such as Callistus, Domitilla, Sebastian, 
Comadilla, etc., opened up chapels, built shrines, and encouraged others to be buried nearby. Ambrose located the bodies of several martyrs and placed them in churches around Milan. He even found relics in places such as Bologna and delivered relics to other communities like Florence, encouraging local philanthropists to dedicate churches to them. He scattered bones like a farmer does seeds, believing that they would stimulate a new growth in the faith. End quote. Dr. Robert Grant of Ambrose University said this about Ambrose. Quote, he scattered bones, like a farmer does seeds. End quote. This Catholic historian explains the patron saint of his university, scattered the bones of the dead, like a farmer does seeds. They were grave robbing the tombs of the catacombs, like shoppers run in for deals, on Black Friday, at a Walmart. The Roman catacombs became a treasure trove of sacred bones and corpses, fraudulently attributed to various saints. Veneration of rotted flesh and bone, became a lucrative business in the new papal empire. And the carcasses of the dead, became the new gold, for the bone rush of the Byzantium Empire. Religious pilgrimages, to shrines called cathedrals, based on possession of these collections, became a very lucrative tourism business for entire cities, which even the emperor's own mother participated in, and sponsored, across the empire. There were dozens of heads offered up, as the head of John the Baptist. Numerous arms legs hands and fingers were offered up to the touring public, from the same saint along with their alleged hair, teeth, toenails and fingernails. And the practice didn't stop with material from the corpses either. They became very creative, and also invented miraculously preserved breast milk, from the Virgin Mary's own breasts, enough splinters from the cross to fill a boat, three original crown of thorns, and even dozens of the miraculously preserved original circumcised foreskin of Jesus's own penis, which was a really big tourism hit, enshrined in numerous cathedrals across Europe each claiming to have the original. Such as was found at, Antwerp, Coulombs, Chartres, Cheru, Metz, Conks, Langers, Anvers, Flickamp, Pian Valais, Auvergne, Hildesheim, Santiago de Compostela, and, Calcutta, all claiming to be the real original miraculously preserved, circumcised penis foreskin, of Christ. Later in history, one Roman Catholic saint, by the name of Saint Bridget, became quite famous for her mystical experiences used to identify the authentic relic of the circumcised foreskin of Christ, in possession of, by the Vatican, as the true one. It was said that she had a vision in which she received the authentic holy foreskin of Christ from an angel, who placed bits of it on her tongue, and caused her to experience, orgasmic-like sensations. Thus proving its authenticity, by divine revelation, inducing this nun's, spontaneous orgasm. If you think this is all relegated to medieval superstition, and no longer relevant, you would be greatly mistaken. Even to this day, in the Church of Rome, the general instruction of the Roman Missal, Chapter 5, Arrangement and Furnishing of Churches for the Eucharist Celebration, Article 266, states, quote, it is fitting to maintain the practice, of enclosing in the altar or of placing under the altar, relics of saints, and even of non-martyrs. End quote. In other words, placing corpses and rotted body parts of the dead, under the Eucharist altar, is still to this day, instructed, as part of the religious practice of the Roman Mass, to this very day. 2017. 16 entire centuries later. There has been no repentance over this necromancy, in the Roman Church, even 16 centuries later. As you can see, prophecy number 5 and verse 2, that he would open up the abyss, was very literally true. The Roman Pontifex Maximus, literally opened up the abyss, for business. But that is not the only way, in which the abyss, or the place of the dead, was literally opened up. John uses the phrase, the well, of the abyss. And his use of that phrase was extremely specific about something which would have been absolutely shocking, to his original Jewish audience. Remember from the use of the term, abyss, in Luke 8, the Jews, including those who followed Christ, associated all this Roman preoccupation with tombs and the dead, with demonic spirits. Not God. These things were seen as antithetical, literally the opposite of, anything involving God, at all. They saw all that, as a demonic practice. The roads along the Vatican Way, during the first century, later where the Vatican would be built, 
were in an area that was also lined with graves on the surface, and the entire area itself was known as the Roman Necropolis, or the City of the Dead. When Constantine returned from his battle at Milvan Bridge, to keep his vow to build a Roman temple in honor of the Christian god. His choice for the site of this new creation, was right in the midst of this necropolis. Around the same time, as the Edict of Thessalonica was decreed, Pope Damasus, built a baptismal pool on the north side of Constantine's Basilica. The water which was used to fill the baptismal pools of the Vatican's first basilica, was water which Pope Damasus literally, had Roman engineers, actually drain, from the surrounding tomb area and catacombs, into the basilica, to be used for baptism. He literally got the water for the Vatican, from, as John puts it, the well, of the abyss. It was water, that had literally soaked corpses and tombs, for centuries. It was the water of the dead. From the well of the abyss, precisely as John described it. The Jewish practice of baptism came from something known as conversion mikvahs. The first requirement for water to be used in this rite, in which the converts were said to be born again, as Jews, was that it be done with what was described as living water. When Christ referred to himself as the living water, he was also making reference to this term and its associated concept. The phrase, living water, though, meant it had to be water connected to a natural source of running water, like a river or creek or fountain of some kind. That is why John the Baptist, baptized people in the Jordan River. It met the requirement that the baptism be done with living water. Water from tombs, would have been off the chart, in terms of being the opposite of living water. It would have been water, saturated and smothered in death, leaving one, completely unclean, and certainly not converted from paganism. Certainly not anything, a valid convert to the Jewish Christianity of the New Testament apostles, would ever have wanted anything to do with. Those who were being baptized in Christianity's first sacred Roman temples, now called churches were being baptized in water drawn, from the tombs of the dead. They were literally being bathed in water, which soaked corpses, in the tombs, for centuries. And thus John's use of the terminology, the well of the abyss, became literally fulfilled, around the very same time, as the Edict of Thessalonica, prophesied additionally by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, revealing the man of sin. John's prophecy actually and literally occurred, in real history. And just so you wouldn't miss the connection, the complex of the Vatican, built on top of the Roman necropolis, from tea stones of Nero's circus, was built in the shape of a giant key, which only heaven could see. So you see, John's use of the phrase, the well, of the abyss, became a very accurate and literal description, of what was to come, under the new Roman Pontifex Maximus, in the creation of his Vatican. And thus why, the Counter-Reformation considered this information, so necessary to hide from the public. Prophecy number 5, was very literally and accurately, fulfilled, in history. Amazingly, just as John had prophesied it, in the very same time frame, John had pointed to, in his astronomical dating. At the end of World War II, when American troops began liberating Europe from Hitler's control, and took control of Germany, they made a gruesome discovery. Millions of people had been exterminated, burned in German furnaces, or buried in mass grave sites, in one of the largest mass killings in modern history. Adolf Hitler, who had been an aspirant to the Catholic priesthood earlier in his life, did not invent the idea, of exterminating masses of unwanted people, in the furnace. Hitler knew from his own German history, and his knowledge of Roman Catholicism, the practice of ethnic cleansing and genocide, was as old as his own country, and his religion. For it was in his own Nuremberg, Germany, the Vatican state, to exterminate Jews, during the Crusades. And what Hitler did in the 1940s, was simply write another chapter, in that very long and ancient history. Even after the ghastly discoveries of death camp ovens and mass graves, in the 1940s, right-wing Catholic dictators in Europe and Latin America, still continued to venerate Hitler as a champion of the Catholic faith. General, Francisco Franco of Spain, said this of Adolf Hitler, after his death. Despite being reported, as a self-inflicted suicide. Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death, when so many were found to exalt his life. 
Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory. The German Holocaust had actually started in Francisco Franco's Spain. Spain's version of the Nazi party was called the Falange. The entire Catholic youth organization in Spain had joined the Falange. During the Spanish Civil War which saw Francisco Franco's rise to power, people were murdered for simply not being Catholic. After Franco came to power, priests made lists of citizens who did not attend Mass. They were rounded up for questioning and murdered. Roman Catholicism was made the state religion and church and state were joined, inseparably, as they were during, the Holy Roman Empire. Or as the arrangement was known in Germany, the Third Reich. When people in Spain, resisted political takeover, by the fascist party, they were condemned by Pope Pius XI. The fascists were praised by Pope Pius and given his blessing, he referred to these Spanish Nazi fascists in Spain as quote, all those who have taken the difficult and dangerous task to defend and reinstate the honor of God and religion and quote. Cardinal Pacelli became Pope as Pope Pius XII. He congratulated the fascist dictator Francisco Franco. Quote, with great joy we address you, dearest sons of Catholic Spain, to express our paternal congratulations for the gift of peace and victory, with which God has chosen to crown the Christian heroism of your faith and charity. As a pledge of the bountiful grace which you will receive from the Immaculate Virgin and the Apostle James, patrons of Spain we give to you, our dear sons of Catholic Spain, to the head of state and his illustrious government, to the zealous episcopate and its self-denying clergy, to the heroic combatants and to all the faithful, our apostolic benediction. End quote. If you think this period of history was simply an anomaly in the Catholic Church, and does not represent the Catholic Church today, you would be mistaken. The Inquisition has been active in very recent history, in countries in both, Latin America and Africa. Both spawning modern genocides. In Argentina, 30,000 Argentinians were exterminated, under the Jesuit Superior General who is now serving as Pope. Which is examined in two videos on this channel, about the election of Jorge Bergoglio to the papacy, known now, as Pope Francis. Almost two centuries ago, earlier in history, a defector from the Catholic Church, and its inquisitions, became a major voice in Europe, against the Vatican. Luigi de Sanctis, was the eldest son of Biagio de Sanctis and Camilla Forzi. De Sanctis became a Catholic priest in 1831, and a member of the Order of the Regular Chancers of Chameleons. In 1835 during the cholera epidemic, he served in Genoa, as chaplain, giving last rites to the sick. De Sanctis held the degree of Emeritus Censor at the Theological Academy, of the University of Rome, and became a fellow of numerous Italian academies. In 1836, Descantis was promoted to Doctrine of Theology in the Roman Catholic Church, and on June 9, 1837, Descantis was appointed qualifier of the Holy Office of the Inquisition in Rome. Descantis served as an appointed qualifier for the Office of Inquisition for a full decade. Cardinal Ludovico Macara, Dean of the Sacred College of Rome, chose Luigi de Sanctis as one of the diocesan examiners of the clergy. In 1838, de Scantis was appointed Professor of Theology at the University of Sapienza. But in 1842, after experiencing the shock of personally participating in an inquisition he was responsible for, as Professor of Theology, he began to think about what he had been involved with, and developed politically liberal and critical ideas about the role and policy of the Vatican. After making known his ideas of reform, he was suspended from his duties and sent to San Eusebio of Rome's convalescence and spiritual exercises and encouraged to review his ideas. His objections of conscience to the Inquisition, however, only continued to intensify and on September 11, 1847, he fleed from Rome to the island of Malta, which at that time, granted asylum for persecuted priests, fleeing from extradition, by the Vatican. After escaping from the Church of Rome, Luigi de Sanctis, went on to become one of the most active missionaries and prolific authors, of evangelical Protestantism, in ecclesiastical history. Today, the vast majority of people who identify themselves as evangelical Protestants, have never even heard of his name. In the book, Roma Papali, Luigi de Sanctis, the former doctorate professor of theology, at the University of Sapienza, 
an inquisitional examiner, recounts what he witnessed at the Vatican, when he became involved with the Papal Inquisition, and the shocking truth he discovered, that turned him against the Vatican. Quote, there was a flight of stairs down one side of a courtyard that entered into an area lighted only by an open grating. It was subterranean, like a sepulcher, greasy, black and soft earth covered the ground and human bones cracked under our feet. We could scarcely contain ourselves at such a sight. My host fumed with indignation, and we came out. We then went down to look at another part of a building where the prisons are, there are small cells, capable of containing one person, under these are the subterranean prisons, they are made from the ruins of the ancient circus of Nero, which was there. In one of these dungeons there was a stone staircase, which led to a still deeper dungeon. It was destined to receive those who were condemned, to be walled up to die. The skeletons that were found here, indicated the mode of their barbarous execution. They let down these unfortunate ones, with their hands and feet tied, they buried them up to the breast, in dry lime, mixed with earth and cement, and left them there, closing the grating above. The positioning of these skeletons, showed the horrible struggle they had before finding death. We came out of that dreadful abode, and continued to visit the old prisons. A little corridor on the left of the courtyard described, led down to another yard, smaller and worse than the first, in it were 60 small cells used as prisons, divided into three floors, 20 on each floor. In many of these cells, there was an enormous iron ring, made to open and shut with a padlock. In the middle of one such prison, was a round stone on the pavement, it covered a well, without water, in which there were skeletons. End quote. Descantis goes on to describe what he called, the Vatican's Palace of Horrors. Quote. They are divided into two stories. Each one has the form of a monk's cell, except that the window is very high up with bars. There remained to be seen the chamber of torture, it was in one of the lowest and most hidden dungeons, it had no window, a door and a passage afforded the current of air necessary for respiration, no other light penetrated but that from lighted torches and the braziers. We went down further by stone steps into what was called the Hall of Torture. The instruments of torture were no longer there, because torture was legally abolished at the end of 1815, a large chimney close by, indicated the place of torture by fire. Now this place is changed to a cellar, the bottles of the Holy Inquisitors fresh. Having pulled down a wall, another cellar was found, but instead of bottles, they found in it, two large ovens, made like beehives, and in these furnaces there were still cows and human bones. But the Holy Inquisition never derogates from its own laws, and when it can no longer burn heretics in the open air, because the smoke would be seen, it burns them in its furnaces. We came out of so dreadful a place, never to return again. End quote. From the book, Roma Papali, by Luigi De Sanctis, translated by Maria Betts, Strand, London, 1905. So you see, not only was John's reference to a key of authority from the well of the abyss, very real and literal, so was his reference to the smoke in the furnace which came from it. Not only was there literally, a well filled with skeletons, next to a furnace complex, in the dungeon of the Vatican, the smoke from these executions and genocides, is recorded by eyewitnesses, actually and literally darkened the skies across Europe, just as they did during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, precisely as John described. The fear and repression of society, during the age of the Papal Empire, led to a repression of progress and knowledge in every sphere, thus coining the term, the Dark Ages, to describe them. And as you saw in the documentary on this channel concerning Mystery Babylon Theology, it is no accident, that the very two symbols used by John to identify the Antichrist, the key and the furnace, are both intentionally coined, as iconic symbols of the Vatican and its Roman Papacy. The key is actually built into the architecture of the Vatican, and smoke from the Great Furnace, is now used to signal the election of the new Pope. Obviously, a real Christian would want to have nothing to do with these two symbols, any more than they would want the name 666. But as you will see, appropriation of these two symbols signaling the Antichrist, is just the beginning of the shockingly hypocritical and contradictory behavior. Virtually, all of the symbols of the Antichrist, mentioned in scripture, will be intentionally appropriated by the Vatican, including even the very name, 666, before it is over. Prophecies 6 and 7 concerning smoke, coming out of the well of the abyss, as if from a great furnace, 
was literally fulfilled in history, in the Vatican furnace, and its well of bones, precisely as John described it in Revelation chapter 9 verse 2. In this video, you have seen a transliterated translation, from the Greek text, of Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 11, concerning the first prophecy of the coming of the Antichrist. And you saw that seven of the first 24 prophecies John lists, are literally fulfilled in history concerning the rise of the Roman papacy, just in verses 1 and 2. In the next video, we will continue marching through the remaining verses of Revelation chapter 9, beginning with verse 3 showing their actual literal fulfillment in history, precisely as John prophesied them. And you will continue to see why, the Counter-Reformation, motivated by political gain and greed, was so entirely desperate, to hide all this information from the public, that you are now seeing, maybe even, for the very first time, in your life. Thank you for watching.